So, uh, as you've just heard, I run Story Things. We are an agency that develops content to build loyal audiences. Um, we do a lot of research into attention, uh, but we are storytellers. That's why we're called Story Things. Um, before that, here's some of the companies we work for, lots of different sectors, a lot of work in the States in particular. Um, uh, we have worked a lot with publishers in the past. Uh, actually, Nathan, who's here uh, today, we built an app for him many, many years ago. Um, I'm actually going to take you back to before I started Story Things. In the 2000s, I was head of innovation for BBC New Media. And then I got headhunted to take a role at Channel 4, the other public broadcaster in the UK, taking over their education department. So up until that point, they had been making content for 14 to 19-year-olds that was broadcast on the TV channel in the morning. And they decided in 2007 that that wasn't the right way to reach the audience. And they rang me and said, we want to shift this six million a year budget online. Do you want to come and find out how we should spend it? So I clearly ran as quick as I could and went and uh, took that blank check. Um, and we experimented a lot over the next couple of years with how to reach that audience, 14 to 19 year olds, with stories about their life, about their interests and stuff like that. And one of the things I found was that even in that era, which as Shona mentioned earlier, was more about MySpace and Bebo than it was about Instagram and TikTok, people were getting caught up a lot in the technology. And what I really wanted to do, because I was talking to an audience when I was trying to get people to pitch projects to me, some of whom came from the TV world, some of whom came from the digital world. My own background was in digital. And so I wanted to try and explain a bit about how I felt people were starting to use social media in a way that didn't talk about the technology. So I ended up talking about six spaces of social media, because we did a lot of research of young people. And what we found was, Partly, the experience of being a teen was still heartbreakingly familiar, um, even though I was no longer of that age group. Um, people are experimenting with their personalities, they're trying to hang out with their friends, they're trying to express who they think they are, they're doing this in lots of different ways. And digital was just a new way for you to do the kind of things that previously we did in the offline world in my generation. So I kind of said that an interesting way of thinking about social media was thinking about it in six different spaces. And all of these spaces meet the needs that young people have around digital media. They need secret spaces where they can hang out with a couple of friends and say things and the expectation is that that's private, that information won't go anywhere else. Um, they need group spaces where they need to get together with people who share the same interests as them, fandoms and, and, and stuff like that. They need publishing spaces where they can actually take their content and publish it to potentially a much bigger audience. There are performing spaces where they are playing a role in a... In, in an experience. Maybe that's in a game world, um, in the offline world. That includes things like sport and drama and stuff like that. They need participation spaces where they're getting together with a much bigger group of people to make something happen. That's where activism lives. That's where a lot of the kind of crowdfunding and, 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 and kind of group um, political action platforms were emerging. And then they also need spaces where they feel like they're part of a crowd, where they feel like they're sharing an experience with lots of other people. So things like festivals and stuff like that. And in this blog post back in 2007, I talked about a couple of platforms that I felt were meeting some of those needs. But I also said that the problem with digital is that sometimes the expectations of that space is not met by the technology, and what you think is a private space actually becomes public. One of the critical things that we found out was that for a lot of the teens, we, we experimented with doing some online documentaries with young people where we followed them for about uh, a year, and we asked them to write about their lives and to keep a blog on Bebo and MySpace at the time. And we found that there was a really important line around here where they were very, very happy to talk about their life um, in private spaces where they felt like they knew the people that they were talking to, but when they went over into that space where randoms could potentially find them, there was a real kind of reticence. So even though we think of young people as being permanently online, they actually have this real reticence about this. So fast forwarding to where we are now, one of the things that really interested me in some Ofcom research that was published in March, um, looking at young people's uh, media lives, they found that actually the social era of the last 15 years, where if you were like me and very, very early and nerdy into Twitter and, and, and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, and we really kind of used those spaces to kind of live our lives online, younger people have been moving away from that a lot in the last few years, and they are more passively consuming uh, content on their social media platforms than they are actively 
publishing. A lot of their kind of chat and publishing happens in those secret spaces and group spaces. It happens in private chats on Instagram. Um, it happens on WhatsApp. It happens in Signal, places like that. So children are posting less themselves and correspondingly seeing less content created by their friends. In many ways, a lot of the content they're seeing um, recommended to them by algorithms is almost more like the TV channels of old. Instead of a scheduler sitting in a broadcaster deciding what's going to go out during the schedule, you've got an algorithm deciding what content you're going to see, which is probably Mr. Beast if it's on YouTube. But anyway, so what's interesting to me is we're seeing this kind of shift in which young people are kind of moving away from those spaces in the middle where they are publishing their content online, and they're either taking their personal content into secret spaces or they're having a more passive experience online. So I still like that six spaces model. I still think it has a relevance, and you can replace the technologies that I wrote about in 2007 with the technologies that teens are using now. But I think those needs, those kind of fundamental needs to have spaces to express yourself are the same. So one of the things we've been doing at Story Things in collaboration with Young Minds, uh, a, a UK charity that works with mental health and young people, is we wanted to find out how the effect of, of hybrid work and post-COVID work has affected this. Um, if you want to see this research, by the way, it's at uh, attentionmatters.uk, which is a newsletter we publish about um, our research into attention. So uh, all of the Scroll Stoppers research is there as well. Um, so I wanted to just pick up six of the trends and the kind of interesting things. This, unlike um, Shauna's amazing quant uh, quantitative data set, this is very much more qualitative. This is based on our conversations. So these insights are based a lot more on, on, on kind of smaller uh, data sets and conversations with young people rather than the fantastic large data sets that, that Shauna has. So one of the trends we're seeing is around curation. Uh, when we asked young people uh, what they were most drawn to, people wanted well-curated, thought-provoking, and visually striking um, content. They wanted somebody to tell them what was interesting. People talked about newsletters a lot, um, and actually adding curation to the content that you make really defines the voice and is a smart filter. There is way more stuff out there than any of us can possibly consider. So actually thinking about curation is a really big thing. A lot of the content strategy we work on for our clients says that effectively when you're thinking about a content strategy for an audience or a community, you can do three things. You can create new content, you can curate existing content, and you can convene the audience together to create a kind of conversation around your content. And we always recommend our, our clients think about those things in equal buckets. You should spend about 30% of your time creating content, 30% curating it, and 30% convening your audience. So curation is a really, really big part of how we all use the web um, and look for information online now. The second one, which I jokingly called in our research workshops mullet media and then hated the phrase, but the team decided to go ahead with it anyway, is about people using the same apps for both work and pleasure. Um, so people said, when we said complete the sentence, when I work from home, I, the top three answers were spending more time in messaging apps, listening to more music, and read more. Um, so when people work from home, they tend to be more empathetic about their consumption, and they think about both what they're doing with work, but also um, things that take them away from the work environment. There has been a bleeding of space between our work lives and our social lives, and we've seen young people start to get a bit more, a bit more kind of rigorous in breaking out of the work mode and going into um, a, 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 a more social mode. And that happens throughout the day. So one of the things they might do is, one of the things you can do about this is think about how your content can fit into that routine. When we've got these more malleable, flexible routines that mix work and home life, how do we kind of suggest to them ways in which your content could be a break from work? You know, could you be the podcast they listen to when they go for a walk? Could you be the book they read? I started, because I'm an old man, actually getting a physical newspaper during lockdown because I just wanted something that wasn't looking at a screen. Um, and I really like that experience of having a physical newspaper every day. So I think we're starting, as Shona said, people are starting to look at things that aren't based on screens. The third one we're seeing is, is as Shona mentioned as well, everything all at once. Um, we're seeing a lot of people uh, move to audio content in particular as something they can do that uses partial or ambient attention. So things that you can do whilst you're doing something else, whether that's something you're doing physical or whether it's something that's in the background. One of the really interesting stats in the UK around radio listening is the morning shows on the big kind of radio stations always used to be the most listened to shows because people would stick it in the car when they're on the commute to work and that would be the highest rating show. The highest rating 
exciting shows now on the BBC and the other channels are the mid-morning shows, because people are starting to put radio on because they're working from home again. Um, so they come into their home office, into their kitchen, the living room, put on the radio in the background. So there is this sense that we want other stuff going on. Um, I really like this quote here, that uh, working from home wreaks havoc with their eyes, so I move to listening to content more, shifting senses from visual to listening. People are kind of thinking about the multiple senses they can use as they engage with content. Um, this one, Say No Foe, is something that we're really noticing, particularly in younger audiences, and Shona mentioned this as well, is people really, really look for authenticity. Um, they're slightly kind of moving against that idea. There's a great quote here, you can follow a creator, and it seems like as soon as they become big, they're out of your relatable zone. You know, in their private communication, their private images, if anyone's got young kids, particularly young daughters as I have, you see the kind of, the kind of stuff that they share with their friends is deliberately grungy and bad, like the photo those are kind of, you know, they're not presenting themselves in the way that people presented themselves on Instagram maybe five, ten years ago as these perfect lives. Um, they're deliberately kind of sharing stuff that's more authentic to their lives. I'm really pleased to see that. I really like the fact that actually, you know, they don't want all the time to see that kind of stuff. We do a lot of work with cultural organizations in the UK, and we're always talking about behind the scenes. People want to see behind the scenes. They want to see kind of like, they don't just want the surface, they kind of want this idea of, of, of what's actually going on behind them as well. Um, the last one, which is particularly interesting, the fifth one rather, which is particularly interesting to you guys, is people are looking for things that are unscrollable. You know, we've all lived in these endlessly refreshing uh, uh, streams over the last few years. Um, and when we asked what people, what type of content could they not do without, the top three were music, again, as Shauna said, really, really huge music uh, consumption in this audience, podcasts as well, and then physical books. And as the quote here says, I feel there's a real pushback against screens and the slot machine feed. The reliance on personal recommendations has gone through the roof. And people, we called the report scroll stop because it feels like there is this really interesting move to people who want things that you can finish, that there is this stuff that actually isn't just a never-ending feed that creates that slight feeling of ennui and, and exhaustion, that actually you can immerse yourself in something which has a really, really strong beginning, middle, and an end. So I really like the fact that you know, the most kind of you know, unmissable content, the stuff they can't do without, is stuff which feels like it has a kind of uh, structure to it. Um, and lastly, and again, this kind of relates to the way we're working as hybrid now. Um, people are using content in a completely different way. Um, we call this trend Swiss Army apps because people aren't necessarily using the apps in the way that they were designed. They're using them to meet their own needs as they work in this hybrid method um, and home and work split. So one interview here says, when I'm at home, I use YouTube videos while I go about my day. They kind of leave it on. Some people talked about leaving music or radio on to feel like you had other people around you. Some people leave open chats open. Um, so people are basically starting to mold the platforms they're using to meet their specific needs um, during the day and to fit into their lives. So think about how your content can be a bit open-ending. How can you kind of think about and learn from the way that people are using your content in ways that are perhaps surprising? And walk with your users. Um, if your users are starting to use your platforms or your services in ways that are surprising, one of the favorite things we love doing when we work with clients is saying, what's your weird data? Like, what is the weird data points you've got that are completely unexpected? You know, what are people doing with your stuff that you've never seen anyone else do? Because sometimes that weird data is a really interesting idea of how your product or service could move uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular direction. When I was at Channel uh, BBC working in innovation, there was a whole um, academic study of what they called lead user innovation. Um, and I went and spoke to some of the experts at MIT who were doing this work. And the idea of lead user innovation is that sometimes your lead users are breaking and using your product in a really interesting way that actually a lot of other people could benefit from. So look at that weird data and look at how people are using your data in a different way. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. The Scroll Stoppers research, as I said, it's at um, attentionmatters.uk if you want to look at it. Um, and I'm at Story Things. Um, I'll be around for uh, most of today. If you want to email me about any of this, I'd love to chat. I'm actually not. Oh, yeah, Story Things is on Twitter. I actually deleted my Twitter account, so I need to take that app Matt Lock off um, because Musk's version of Twitter is not what I'm interested in. But you can get me at matt at storythings.com. Thank you very much.